Oh, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Good. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It doesn't take a super spiritual person to know that right now God is doing something. Amen. You know what this is called? When the feeling that you're feeling right now, that's called the Holy Spirit working in your heart. Yeah. Right now, he's speaking something to each and every one of you. Amen. Right? God doesn't always come in ways that we expect. Sometimes God shows up and things kind of get a little messy, a little out of control, a little, you know, what's going on. But all the time, God is saying something through those moments. And I believe that that was a special moment during worship. And somehow it always happens during worship. We have moments like that where something is so clear. God is so clearly doing something. And sometimes we can kind of turn ourselves off to it and, and think that, okay, uh, this is just a big distraction, right? But in actuality, God is actually speaking to us in that moment. And that's the most important moment for us to be open and listen and hear and move. Amen. I love this church because right away when people notice something, they jump right into action. They started to pray. They started to sing louder. They started to worship. And that's what I, I love. And, and you know what? I was praying up here and I was already feeling something during worship. But when that moment broke out and people started to pray and people started to worship, I felt a greater presence of the Lord. And how many of you guys were with me there? You felt it. Everybody felt it. It doesn't take a super spiritual person to realize that God was actually moving in that moment, and we have to be open, right? God, when, when we say, God, have your way, and God, take control, we mean it. And in those moments, God speaks the clearest and the loudest, and I, I love those moments, right? Amen. One of my most powerful times of worship happened when I was leading worship, and during the middle of the worship, somebody started screaming, ah! during the worship, right? <laughs> and it was so loud and so distracting, but right away, the people around them started to pray for that person, started to speak life into that person. And the situation, what was once a distraction, turned to a, a heavenly glorif glorified moment. So uh, let's just uh, kind of gather ourselves back. Let's focus ourselves back onto the Lord. Let's open our hands, open our hearts, and let's receive this morning from him. You know what? He's got a special message for each and every one of you. You know, there's a reason why all of you guys are here specifically, because he's got something specific he wants to share with you. So let's open up our hearts and open up our ears today to the Holy Spirit and what he's doing. Lord, we thank you, God, for how you're moving in this place today. We thank you, God, for the revelation that we're going to receive through this yeah. word today, Lord. We thank you, God, for the move of God that is so great that we cannot comprehend, that we cannot understand. And Lord, I pray that we would just move and flow with your spirit today, Lord God. That anything that would distract us or anything that would stop us from moving and flowing with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that those things will be quelled right now. Those things will be silenced right now. That our hearts, our ears, our eyes, they would be open to receive from you today, Lord. We thank you, God, for the revelation we are to receive in this message, Lord, you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Wow. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> some returning faces, familiar faces. Some of you guys have been with us all along. Um, but we welcome you here to NUMA, even those joining in online on Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. We are at the end of our series, His Story. If you haven't been with us or if you're returning from us uh, to us, we, are, we have been studying uh, the books of the Bible, the stories of the Bible, and taking away what we can learn from each character, from each uh, historian, from each book of the Bible, and pretty much breaking down what the main points are and what we can learn from them. And now we're at the very end of our series, the close of our series, and I like to think that God has saved the best for last. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so I'm honored and I'm blessed to be here with you guys today to share with you the book of Revelations. And now let me get my clicker, or find my clicker, and if I don't, it's okay. I can rely on Rhea back there to click for me. But we are just doing an intro, okay? When, when Pastor Romy approached me, or when he told me that I was going to be preaching on the book of Revelations, <laughs> you can imagine my face. I was like, okay, in one week, in one Sunday, we're going to be talking about the book of Revelations. That is a lot of information to go through. So we're going to be going through it quickly, okay? So bear with me. 
I have never preached on the book of Revelations. In fact, I'll let you know a secret. I never really even read the book of Revelations. Uh, <laughs> how many of you guys have read the book of Revelations? Okay, good. So you guys are ahead of me. I have not before doing this sermon. So bear with me. Um, I've always kind of been kind of scared to read the book of Revelations. I don't know if anybody has felt that before about reading the book of Revelations. I don't know why. Growing up, I always thought that the book of Revelations was scary. You know, when you think about Revelations, maybe you think about, you know, the Antichrist or the end of the world, 666, the world burning, hell. Maybe that's what you think of when you read the book of Revelations. But in my study, reading this book throughout this week, I've learned that, you know what, it's not actually about hellfire and condemnation. There's actually a lot of hope that is buried Amen. in this book. And so that's what we're going to dive deep in today. How does the book of Revelations actually give us hope? All right. How many of you guys are excited about the end of the world? Yeah. yeah. All right. Everybody, right? How many of you guys know that Jesus is coming back? Hallelujah. <laughs> He's coming back. Whether you're ready, whether you're not, whether you like it, whether you don't, whether you believe it or whether you, you don't believe it, Jesus is coming back. Yeah. And when he comes... There are only, he's going to divide, the Bible says he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. He's going to divide the weeds from the wheat, right? And you are, all of us are either going to be wheat or sheep, or, or no, I'm sorry, wheat or weed, sheep or goat. We're one or the other, light or dark. We're either his children, his followers, his disciples, or we're the, the people who have failed to believe, all right? So we want to be ready for when that time comes. And how many of you guys know that the book of Revelations was written for us so we can be ready? Yeah. Right? Have you ever taken a test in college or in high school? Right? Imagine you take a test and on your way to school, you see a cheat sheet with all the answers, all the questions that are going to be asked. You see it on the sidewalk as you're walking to school. Would you not pick that up and read it? to learn what the answers are going to be on the test, to learn what the questions are, to learn how things are going to play out. That's exactly why the book of Revelations was written. Amen. It was written for Christians and believers like us so we can be prepared, so we can be ready when Jesus comes back. Okay? He has given us the ultimate cheat sheet so we can expect what he's going to do at the end of the days so we don't lose hope and we don't lose faith and we can stand firm. Only those people, only those believers who understand and know the truth will, uh, 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 will be ready for, for this time, okay? All right, so don't be scared and don't think of Revelation. I want to change people's minds today not to be scared of Revelations or the end times or the end of the world or the apocalypse is what people say. Don't be scared, okay? Because uh, as long as you have Christ in your heart, you're going to the right place. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's uh, do a little bit of background on the book of Revelations. Uh, the book of Revelations, and Ray is going to help me because I don't have the clicker. It was uh, written in 95 AD is what they say. It is, if you're following us when how these books are written, it's the very last book of the Bible and the very last book written. Okay, It was written thought to be by John the Beloved, John the Disciple. All right? And if you do the math, John the Disciple, he was a young boy when, Jesus, uh, when he went on Jesus' ministry, and now it's 95 AD, he's old. All right? he's, an, he's an elderly man, and it's written from the island of Patmos. Okay? How many of you guys know on the map where the island of Patmos is? Yeah, it's a very, very tiny, 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 small island. In fact, it's off the, land, off the coast of Greece. And during that time, it is where all the prisoners went, okay? They got tired of putting people in jail where they could break out and break free, so they banished them to the island of Patmos. And the island of Patmos is rich in a, uh, a natural material of marble, right? Marble is where Rome and the great Roman Empire, they made all their bi big buildings and they made all their big statues. And so uh, they got that material, a lot of it, from the island of Patmos, right? So every day... John the Beloved, John the Disciple, is uh, breaking up the marble, breaking up the rocks. He's in jail, he's in prison, and it actually says in Revelations 1-9 that he's in, in, he's in prison because of the gospel. He was persecuted because of the gospel. We uh, learned that 
during this time, the Roman Empire was very harsh on Christians, very harsh. Uh, Bernero, and I, th- I believe his name was Dionysius or something, they were the emperors at that time, and they were very hard on Christians. And many, many Christians during that time were expecting Jesus to come back, right? They had been told, they had been told that Jesus was coming back, and in their minds, they were thinking it, that he was coming back in their lifetime. And so there's a lot of things uh, that was written in the, uh, in the book of Revelations. It's a letter, okay? The, the, the word revelations come from this word apocalypsis, the Greek word apocalypsis, and this means apocalypse. And it also means uh, the meaning of apocalypse is to unveil, is to reveal, right? Revelations chapter 1, verse 1 actually says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is the unveiling of Jesus Christ, who he is. The funny thing about the book of Revelations, we know that Jesus has many names, right? Many of the names that Jesus is referred to is actually first revealed in the book of Revelations, right? He's the firstborn of the dead, is what they say, because he's the one who died, and he rose again, and he stayed alive, right? We know that Lazarus died, and he rose again, but Lazarus eventually died again, right? But Jesus is the first to die, rise again, and never die again. He's in a glorified body. He's the firstborn of the dead. There's many other names. He's the Alpha and the Omega, right? That's mentioned in the book of Revelations. It's, it's, never, in, it's never in the Bible before, but it's first mentioned in the book of Revelations, right? The Alpha and Omega is the same as saying he's A to Z. Alpha being the first letter of of the Greek alphabet and Omega being the last letter, right? Uh, So it's the same as saying Jesus is beginning and end. He's A to Z. He's everything, in everything. He has his hand on everything. All time is in his hand. That's what it means. There's so many names of Jesus that are written in the book of Revelation that I would love to study, but we don't have time for it today. Quick side note. If you have something in mind that you would like Pastor and I to share about, write it on a suggestion and put it in our suggestion box over here. We do an announcement every Sunday, Guy Noel and uh, Tita Gloria and Ate Jessa. They do an announcement every Sunday to write your suggestions down for the next year and put them in the box. Right? I took a look at the box this morning. There's only one paper in it. So (laughs) if you have a suggestion, okay, you have something that you want us to share about, You have something you're interested in, uh, maybe something in the Bible you're questioning, write it down on a piece of paper, throw it in the suggestion box. Pastor and I will take a look at it, okay? All right? So that includes the name of Jesus. That includes, if you want to go deeper into the book of Revelations, like I said, we're just doing the intro today, okay? So this is meant to just gear you up and prepare you to go out and study the real thing, or maybe sometime in Bible study we we can go deeper. But this... Book of Revelations is just the revealing of who Jesus Christ is. All of his names. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the great I am. It all culminates to this, to this one chapter, to this uh, one moment, right? Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody will know who he is by the end of days. By the, by the time Jesus comes back, everybody is going to know who he is. And we also have to keep in mind that this is also a letter. It's a, it's a profound book of prophecy, but it was a letter. So who was it written to? Well, it was written to, the, to seven churches in Asia Minor, right? I can't name all the ter- churches off the top of my head, and we won't go too deep into it. But this is actually a letter, in fact, meant to be passed around to the book to the churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day uh, Turkey, right? Ephesus, um, Philadelphia, right? All of those churches that we'll go a little bit deeper into. Um, it was written for them so they could understand and prepare themselves for the second coming of Christ, okay? So, to continue laying down the foundation, are you guys still with me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> good. There are three scholarly interpretations of Revelations, how you read Revelations, okay? Number one, there's an allegorical interpretation, okay? There's a big fancy word, and it means that everything is a symbol. Everything is a metaphor. There are some people who read 
the book of Revelations, and, instead, and when it talks about a white horse, when it talks about a red horse, it talks about a black horse, it doesn't actually mean a red horse or a black horse. It, it's kind of a symbol for something else, right? When they talk about the seals and the scrolls and the trumpets, there's not going to be an angel that's actually going to be there and blowing a trumpet, but it's more like an um, a, uh, analogy, a metaphor, right? There's also the historical interpretation of how to read Revelations. This means that in this interpretation, the book of Revelations was meant for the, the day of John the disciple. When he wrote it to the letters of the churches, the seven churches, it was meant for them to encourage them during that day. In fact, um, people say that before that letters can be sent off to churches, the Romans, they would read the letters, right? And so if they would see something that was against the emperor at the time, then they would not send that letter, right? So they would proofread and read through every letter that was written before they'd send it off, right? And so there's a uh, theory that the book John, when John wrote the book of Revelations, that he wrote everything in like a code, like a secret code. When he says, talks about the Antichrist, he's actually talking about the emperor of Rome. When he talks about the four horsemen, he's actually talking about the armies of Rome, Right? So that's kind of like the historical interpretation. And thirdly, um, there is the uh, literal, liturgical interpretation of Reve Revelations, meaning everything and all the events that described in the, in the book of Revelations is meant to be taken literally. So when he says that a white horse does come down, it's literal. There are a white horse that is going to come down. When it talks about the, the plagues, and when it talks about the the uh, fire and brimstone falling from heaven, those are all literal things that all those things do come down, okay? So those are the three different interpretations of how to read the book of Revelations. And today, we're mostly going to be uh, interpreting it in an allegorical and liturgical context, okay? <laughs> I want you to keep that in mind as we go out throughout this sermon, okay? So sometimes not everything is going to be literal. Sometimes things are going to be symbolic. Sometimes not everything is going to be symbolic. Sometimes they're going to be literal, okay? And it's up to us to kind of decipher what John the uh, disciple is, is saying and what these prophecies mean when he's talking about which, okay? So don't worry. I'm going to help you through that. It's not going to be uh, super tough. But before that, how many of you guys know how the world's going to end? <laughs> right? Not many. I, don't, I myself, I'm not an expert, okay? So like I said, this is just an intro. You go on and do your own study. But this is a timeline. This is a timeline of the events of the end of the world. Okay, rough timeline. If you're a Protestant Lutheran Christian, that should be all of us. If you believe that Jesus died, rose again, he's in your heart, died for our sins, that you are, um, you are Protestant, you are Lutheran, this is what you are going to uh, believe. Okay? So, number one, uh, the timeline goes like this. Jesus ascends in Acts chapter 1. Number 2, after he ascends, we enter what's called the church age, which is described in Revelations 1 through 2, 3. And these are the different phases of the church that the church has gone in throughout the, the, the history of, uh, of uh, between, <laughs> sorry, between when Jesus died and to now, right? Most of us believe that we are still in the church age today, Okay which we have to be, because the next one is the rapture. <laughs> we haven't been raptured yet, so that means we're still in the church age, amen? <laughs> so the rapture is described in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, what happens during that rapture time, okay? This is when Jesus comes on the clouds. For uh, Thess Thessalonians chapter 5, we get this word uh, to be caught up or to be raptus. This is where we get the word rapture from. Rapture is not in the Bible, but the word Raptus is, it's in Thessalonians chapter 5, and this is when we get caught up and changed in the twinkling of an eye. So when Jesus comes back to rapture us, it's going to be really quick. He's going to come, we're going to see him in the sky, he's going to, uh, uh, and then we're going to, uh, he's going to come actually on the Mount of Olives, right? And then we're all going to be instantly changed, instantly, poof, almost like that. The twinkling of an eye is what it's described as, okay? And then after that, we have seven years of tribulation. So thankfully, we're not going to be here during this time, okay? We're, we're already going to be with the Lord in heaven, right? He, this is when the world goes through seven years of tribulation. How many of you have heard this term before? Yes. You've heard of this, right? Yes. This, is, um, 
described in Revelation chapter 6 through 18. So the bulk of Re Re Revelations is talking about what's going to happen in these seven years. We have these seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, right? Um, there are, are going to be terrible, terrible things that are going to be happening on earth. But like I said, we, uh, we're going to be safe in the Lord, uh, with the Lord, okay? So why would God do this? Why would God inflict seven years of these horrible, horrible, excuse me, things, okay? Well, it's, believe it or not, because he loves us, okay? And I want to explain this to you. So those who are saved already are going to be with the Lord. Those who are still unsaved, they need a bigger and greater wake-up call. You know, I was, uh, I was the, um, you know, in, in school sometimes, there would be kids who would get in trouble in the class, right? There would be kids who would mess around, and, and the teacher would tell them, hey, stop, right? And some kids would stop, but then there are also some individuals who continue to make trouble, right? And for those individuals, the teacher would either send them to the principal's office or send them to detention, and worst case, the student would get expelled, right? They need greater and greater wake-up calls in order to change, right? This is what it's going to be like during this period, right? And it's because of Christ's love that he wants to stop us from spending eternity in heaven, that he would do this. It's to get our attention. During that time, nobody's going to deny God. Nobody's going to say that God isn't real because half of us are going to be gone, like, like age of, uh, like the Avengers, like the blink, <laughs> right? The, the dusting is what they say, it, right? It's, It'll be like that. There'll be nobody at that time. The only ones who will be left are those who refuse, who choose to refuse to believe. Okay? And those are the ones that need a bigger wake-up call to turn, them, to turn to God. Okay? What comes after the seven years of tribulation is Jesus' second, second coming. So Jesus actually comes twice, right? The first coming, he comes on the clouds. Jesus comes on the clouds and we get ascend with him, we meet him in the clouds, and we go to heaven, right? The third, the, the second, second coming is when he actually touches down on the earth, okay? When he touches down on the earth, it says the saints are going to be with him, so we are going to be with him, and he's going to rule the earth for 10,000 years, okay? He's going to stop the battle of Armageddon, oh, 1,000, sorry, and, he's, and then the, there's a reign on earth, God, Jesus is going to reign on earth with us, for 1,000 years, okay? This is the timeline. I know it's, it's confusing. And this is in Revelations, uh, this is described in Revelations 19. And finally, the last uh, thing is uh, there's going to be a new heaven, new earth. Jesus would establish a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, and this is described in Revelations 20 to 21, okay? Follow me, okay? You can take a picture of this. You can write it down. We're going to be referring to this throughout the sermon today. Okay, but this is the timeline of the events that are to happen. All right? Okay. So, before we even start reading the uh, book of Revelation, we have to read the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 says this, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while he looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white, the disciples, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken from you to heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Right? So we know that in the story of the book of Acts, Jesus ascends into heaven. He spends about 40 days with his disciples, showing them. Uh, his wounds, right, performing miracles, walking with them, and then he gives out the Great Commission, and then he ascends up into heaven, right? So the, the angels here are saying that Jesus is going to come the exact same way. In other words, he's, it says here that he is taken up into the clouds, okay, the clouds. Now, whenever I preach uh, or whenever I hear people preach or share about the end times, people always, you know, there's always that one person who who thinks that they're super smart, right? And they'll come up to me or they'll come up to the pastor and they'll say, remember, it's a thief in the night. You can't, you know, nobody can tell the day or the time, thief in the night, right? So it's kind of pointless to study the book of Revelations because we don't know when it's going to end, right? There's always that one person who always makes that comment, 
right? <laughs> but even though we don't know the exact day or the exact time that Jesus comes back, we are commanded to beware of the season, right? If you look, at, if you look outside right now, how many of you know that winter is coming? And how do we know that winter is coming? By the signs of the times, by the seasons. We see the leaves falling, okay? The weather getting colder, all right? The sunlight beginning to fade, right? Some of us, uh, it's, you know, we, we have to prepare for winter. We're getting out our winter coats, our jackets. Some of you guys wear jackets today. Some of you guys are preparing your lawn for winter. Some of you guys are preparing uh, your homes, you know, making sure that everything is working, make sure your heater's working. Right? And we know that winter is coming, even though there's no snow outside, even though it's not negative degrees outside yet, but we know that it's coming because of the time. We don't know the exact day when it's going to snow, right? Not yet anyways. We don't know the exact moment that the snow is coming, but we have to be prepared. We have to turn off our water hoses, right? <laughs> How many of you guys turned yours off? I turned mine off already. <laughs> I got early this year, All right? Some of us are going into our closet and taking out our old sweaters. They're, we're putting away our summer clothes, right? It'd be silly to, for somebody to go out and swim with, 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 with shorts right now. It'd be kind of silly, right? Because we all know that it's coming. In the same way, Christians, we are to be aware that the end is nearing. The end draws near, that Jesus is coming back soon, okay? You can look at the news today, okay? You can, you can probably read three, four different headlines that tell you that Jesus is coming back soon, right? These things are to be expected. In fact, Matthew chapter 24 says, As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, telling, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So the disciples asked Jesus, How do we know when the end is coming? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying that I am Christ. So that's number one. And they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Number two, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Right? That's, that's number three. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Right? So, the, but these are just the beginning of birth pains. Okay? So it's kind of weird if you read this for the first time. Why does Jesus describe the end of the world like birth pain, right? How many of you guys have given birth before or had a baby before, right? You know, you know that when it's time to give birth, you have contractions, right? And what are contractions? Contractions are painful, uh, you know, muscle contractions that you feel when your body is getting ready to give birth to the baby, right? When you first start having contractions, they come like kind of separate. They come far apart. You might not have them. You might have one contraction, and then it takes five hours, and then you have another contraction. You might have, you know, one contraction a day, right? <laughs> but how many of you know that the sooner you get to the, the, the date of birth of your child, the more contractions you start to get? All of a sudden, you start to get contractions every hour, every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, and then it starts to feel like you're having contractions constantly. This is how the end of the world will happen. This is how we need to pay attention because it's going to come separately. We're going to hear about one earthquake there, and then it's going to be a couple, uh, some time, and then we're going to hear about another story, right? And then we're going to hear about one disaster, and then it's going to take some time, and then we'll hear about the other disaster. But as the end of time, as Jesus is coming approaches, more and more of these things will start to happen and, and keep happening, right? Right? Oh, man, it's just crazy if you just think about the past um, year, the past three years, right? We've had famines. We've had economic collapse, right? Uh, how many of you guys have taken a look at the housing market, right? We've had a pandemic. We've had major earthquakes. We've had, and now we've had wars, right? Wars in Ukraine, and now we've got another big war on our hands, right? Between Israel and, and Gaza. You see, these things are, and we notice that these things are starting to happen closer and closer together. You understand? 
Get me? So that's what it is. And it's the world getting ready for Jesus to come back. Okay? Now, I don't want to scare you because <laughs> nobody knows. Nobody knows when he's coming back. People were so confident that Jesus was going to come back during the World War II, right? When Hitler, people were so confident that Hitler was the Antichrist or Stalin was the Antichrist. There were Jews being persecuted. People were so confident that Jesus was coming back during that time. And what happened? He didn't. There are many other people who said that Jesus is coming back, that the war on Iraq or the war on terrorism or the Cold War or something, these were all Putin or whatever, they're all the Antichrist and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we have to be careful to be aware but not get caught up in trying to figure out the exact day or time, okay? If you're, if you're getting the wrong idea, if you're trying to figure out the exact moment that Jesus is coming back, okay? Because you will never know, we will never know, but still be aware of the times, okay? I remember people were saying that um, Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist, right? Because of his name, Ronald has six letters, his middle name Wilson has six letters, and his last name Reagan had six letters. So they were saying, oh, he's the Antichrist, he's 666, right? Some people were saying that Trump, President Trump, was the Antichrist, right? Because it was Trump and then the Vice President Pence, right? So Trump Pence, like trumpet, right? <laughs> and so they were saying, oh, he's the first trumpet and blah, blah, blah. Okay, we can't, we have to be careful. Don't get caught up in that stuff, okay? That's not what the end of the world is about. Okay. I remember when those uh, microchips first came out on those credit cards. There, how many of you guys, some of you guys were scared to use that credit card, right? <laughs> because they're like, all oh, that tapping, it's, it's getting easier and easier. Now they're just going to install it into your hand and there's going to be whatever microchip. Okay, don't be, don't, don't get caught up in that stuff, all right? Um, Jesus is coming back and that's a good thing, all right? Ray is telling me to speed up, so I'm going to keep going. Next. We have the rapture. Now we're actually going to start reading Revelation. <laughs> this is how it's going to happen. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Okay. So here we have our first example of an allegory interpretation, right? Or maybe it could be both. It could be literal and, and allegorical because we know what clouds are. If you read this word, it says he's coming with the clouds, right? In Hebrews chapter 12, I don't have the verse, but it talks about the cloud of witnesses, the people of great faith. Remember we studied by faith, Adam, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, by faith, Abel, by faith, uh, was it David? All of these things by faith. And at the end, in chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. So, um, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, let us not lose heart. Let us not lose faith. So when Jesus is coming back with the cloud, he's actually referring to the man and the woman of faith. So they're going to appear, and every eye will see. First chapter, uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 actually says this. It describes it more in detail. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remaining shall be caught up together, raptured together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So when the rapture occurs, he's going to be there with the, the men and women of faith who have gone before us and, and the dead will rise, and we will go. Okay? Make sense? <laughs> okay. So that is the rapture. Revelation chapter 5 describes what happens when we get raptured. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth was able to open the scroll. I wept because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll. But one of the elders said to me, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. This is the beginning of the, the, the seven years of tribulation. And I looked, and behold, the lamb, as though it had been slain. He came and he took the scroll out of, the, out of him who sat on the throne. So we have two revelations of Jesus Christ right here. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the root of David. Now, in the Old Testament, these two things where you see these 
names referred to more often. And this was the messianic Christ who was going to come and overthrow the government and dominate the earth and, and conquer the earth, right? But instead of this lion, instead of seeing this uh, Judah, this lion of the Judah, what does uh, John see here? He sees the lamb that was slain. See, Jesus doesn't conquer with authority and rule, although he has all authority, he has all power, and he has dominion, but he conquers through his sacrifice. Amen? Amen. Through the lamb. And only through the lamb is he worthy to open that scroll. Amen? <laughs> all right. So Revelation chapter 5, we're going to keep going. Okay. When I looked, I heard the voice of many angels, living creatures and the elders, and a number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is this Lamb who was slain, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth in the sea. I heard say, Blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne. Amen. Can you imagine that? 10,000 upon thousands upon thousands, crying out, Blessing and honor and glory and, and power to them who sits on the throne, right? I, uh, I love music, right? And I love going to, to, uh, going to concerts, right? One of my favorite concerts that I've gone to was like a, a Hillsong concert, a Hillsong United concert, right? And I loved it so much. You're in this arena, and there's so many people. And then you, when, they, when they come on the stage, when the band comes on the stage and the lights open, you hear all these people roar, right where you go to football games or basketball games and or baseball games and when somebody scores a whole run or does a touchdown or makes a impossible basket right you hear the crowd will stand up yeah right steph curry makes a three from half court yeah right it's it's amazing and i remember being in that auditorium and the the hill song came on right and the concert and everybody started shouting and i started to feel tears I actually started to feel like I started to tear up because I know that Jesus is worthy. I love, I love football. I love the Vikings. But I know that Jesus, when the crowd goes wild, it kind of makes you feel like we should be doing that in church. <laughs> Amen? We should be celebrating God in the same way. And I know that Jesus is worthy of all of those, if, if moments like that can make me feel like that, right? How many of you guys know what I'm saying? Yes. He is worthy, and I long for that. I long for that moment when we hear the 10,000s of thousands crying out, worthy is the Lamb. Blessing and honor, power to Him, okay? Awesome stuff. We're going to keep moving. I know I'm, I'm like a little bit over, okay? But I want to get through this. I want to get through this. The seven years of tribulation. So there's a tendency and a fear to kind of jump the gun on the, se the seven years of tribulation. We, uh, we kind of feel like all this stuff is happening and we feel like we're in the tribulation or whatever, but reality is um, it hasn't happened yet, okay? So the first seal, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering. Okay, hold on. You know what? I think I might not go into this. <laughs> we might have to save this for another sermon because I missed a very important point I wanted to make. Okay, and then we'll, we'll close it on this next point. In, um, it, it says this, in, in these verses, right? I didn't write it here on my iPad. But if you look at the church age, the, a couple of slides, right? Uh, before this, I'm sorry. Before this, yeah. Okay, right here, right here. Let's read these verses together. and let's, These are letters written to the church during this time, okay? Okay, I wanted to pay attention. This is going to be awesome, okay? This, okay, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven global lampstands, I know your works, okay? We're not going to go too deep into what these, church, these churches are and what these letters mean, but I encourage you to go out on your own time. But this next letter, read this. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. These things say the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works. Next, next letter. To the angel in Pergamos, write. These things say who? 
he who sharp edged sword, I know your works. Read it together because I can't really read it together. Uh, the next one on, the, on Thyra. To the, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works. Next one. To the angel in the church of Sardis, right? These things he says, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You see a theme here? Next one. To the, to the angel in the church in Philadelphia, right? These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and one, no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Last one. Revelations, to the angel in the church of Laodiceans, right? These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. I know your works. So there's a theme here, okay? Jesus doesn't say, I know your faith. He doesn't say, I know your hope. He doesn't say, I know your love, although very important in the church. The most important thing, I know your works. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest revelations that God shared to me during this study, he doesn't say, I know your heart. So I've heard that so many times. I know your heart. God knows your heart. God knows your heart. And it's true, God does know your heart. Okay? But even God knowing your heart, if you choose to sin and, and not believe, you still disobey right? Sometimes we use that as our excuse. Oh, I, I, I know that uh, this is not right, but God knows my heart. I'm going to do it. It's not, it's not biblical because we are going to be judged by our works. What we do, our faith in action, right? We are to be moved by our faith and it's supposed to cause us to move. If we have no actions, no works without uh, deeds without, without action. If we have faith without those things, then our faith is dead, right? We're kind of scared of that, right? Oh, it's not about works don't get you into heaven. Deeds don't get you into heaven, right? And deeds alone don't. Works alone don't. But faith ought to propel you to doing action, into movement to do those things, right? Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay? So I want to, uh, I guess we'll close there. We may go into this sermon deeper later on, but um, yeah, I want to encourage you that um, to be encouraged by the book of Revelations. Don't let it discourage you. As long as you're on, as long as you have Christ in your heart and Jesus in your, in your life and he's that Lord, you don't have to worry about the end of the world, right? Amen? So let's stand here. I know I'm leaving you guys wanting more. And that's, that's the way I want it. <laughs> that's the way I want it. Uh, maybe sometime in the future when we got more time, we'll go deeper into the message. But I encourage you, even in your own time, read this book, go through it, ask, ask me. You can always message me or pastor, you know, uh, about this. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for the revelation in the book of Revelation, Lord. The revelation of who you are, Jesus Christ. Lord, this book, it's not a, ultimately it, it prophesies about the end of the world, but in the end, it just unveils who you are. It just unveils uh, how, how great your love is for us, how, how to the lengths that you would go to save your children, to the lengths that you would go to wake us up, to cause us to turn to you, to turn away from our sin, to turn away from ourselves, and to look to you, Lord. I thank you, God, that you would do anything and all things possible if it meant one person were to turn to you. And Lord, I believe, Lord, there's people in this room today who they're right now, they feel like they want to turn to you, Lord. Whether it be in their personal life, whether it be in their faith life, in their walk, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, that this is that moment for them that they turn to you, Lord. And we acknowledge, Lord, that your presence is moving into this place. It's moving through our hearts, Lord God. And this message will stir something new, a fire in us, Lord God, to be passionate about what we do with our faith, what we do. Lord God, with, with our walk in Christ, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you would stir the flames of fire in us, Lord. 
You would stir them up, Lord, and they would propel us, Lord, out of our seats into action, Lord. I pray that this message today, Lord, would so cause something in us, Lord, to rise up, that we would be warriors. We'd be end-time warriors for you, Lord God. We would be acknowledged, Lord God, by your Holy Spirit at the end of these days, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. We pray your Holy Spirit will continue to fill us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Thank you, Numa. Amen. I think... Okay. Amen. Praise to God. I think the message is perfectly simple and, uh, and it's really clear for all of us. Jesus has the promise. I think that's what we need to think about. To those who are faithful like you, Jesus has the promise. A promise to have that marriage heaven and earth become one jesus the god almighty the first and the last become one to us and it's gonna be with us amen i'm excited i'm looking forward that jesus is gonna come soon and it's not being selfish but that is what it should be and that is what's gonna be like and the end of the world is something that we hope for it's not something that we is scared about because we have jesus in our heart and you know what is the end of the world means it's in revelation chapter 22 no more tears no more fears no more suffering no more sin no more death that is the hope that we have and that is eternal and I pray for all of us to receive that today if you have Jesus in your heart just receive it and embrace it the truth about Jesus that he is our Savior and he is our Alpha and Omega the first and the last and if you don't have Jesus in your heart accept him as your personal Savior and Lord of your life because he's the hope is the hope for everyone amen i don't know if you have desires in your heart whatever that desires in your heart right now with that hope that we have in jesus rest upon that hope and take it and embrace it to your life and may the lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm just going to pray one more thing here. We know that. God give what he is asking for I believe that's what you said like when you ask it will be given when you knock it will be open the door for you and when you seek it will you will find amen I believe that and today the same thing we're gonna have a testimony today because we're gonna experience healing I mean if you believe that I need healing myself and I want to experience it today, that the healing that God brought us, not just only uh, physical healing, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. Amen? Let's do it. 